I'm going to file a reverse here just a moment. How many of you, um, how many of you have some sort of health insurance or health coverage? Would you raise your hand? You have something? All right. All right. Some of you are looking at your parents. We have something. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, why do we why do we have health insurance? Because we might get sick. Is that right? Is that why we have it? All right. How many of you um, have car insurance? Would you raise your hand? All right. Now, why do you have car insurance? Well, you have car insurance because you might have a wreck. True? All right. Um, how many of you have life insurance? Let me see your hand. All right. Now, why do we have life insurance? Because we might die, right? We might be in a wreck. We might get sick. We might die. Now, I am not against any of those things. Not a one. I think you ought to have all three of you. Amen. Not against that at all. All right? But I want you to look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And I asked, I started off the message that way because I want us to see something. All right? That all of us that raised our hands, we all spend time every single day and every single week dealing with possibilities. Things that might happen, right? All right? We might get sick. Uh, we might have a wreck. And we might die. You say, well, preacher, it's not a might on death. Well, yes, it is. If the rapture were to happen today, I ain't dying. Amen? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? So even death is just a possibility. So I'm not against those. Here's, here's where I'm trying to go with the challenge of the message today. If we give time to possibilities, should we not give our earnest heed to something that is a certainty? If we give ourselves the possibilities, what about certainties? Now, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, I want you to look, if you have a copy of the King James Version of the Bible, I'm going to stop here a couple of times, and I want you to say what the word is, all right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10, the Bible says, for, what's the next word? It's the word we, all right? Now, who's the we? All right, talk about people who are saved, all right? It's Corinthians, this is to a church, church of Corinth, this is believers, all right, for we, people who are saved, and what's the next word? Must. It's the word must. Right? Must. We must. Not maybe. Right. Not there's a chance. We must. And what's the next word? All. All, all right? Again, I said, how many of you have health coverage? All right? Yes. All right? But uh, not everybody gets sick. Right? Praise God. Not everybody gets in a car wreck. Praise God. Not everybody, as we already talked about, is going to die. But here's the thing. If you're saved here this morning, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because God knows your heart. But if you can say this morning, I am saved. I know that I'm saved. Then here's the thing. What I'm getting ready to preach today will happen to you. Not maybe, not might be. You will, notice this, appear before the judgment seat. Now, notice these next two words, every one. Notice the word all. Notice the word every one in this verse. May receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, I want to be just very honest with you this morning. As your pastor, I want you to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Our teacher in, in the Bible Institute last week said something interesting. He said that there is a crown that a faithful pastor can win. But then he said this. He said he believes that also people in his church that helped him and encouraged him and prayed for him and followed him as he followed Christ can also win that same crown. Wouldn't that be great? I think that'd be great. I'd love to see many that I've pastored in this church and the church that i pastored before get the pastor's crown because you were a blessing and an encouragement and a help to your pastor. Now let's flip it on the other hand. It would be a great joy for me to know that if I prayed for you and preached and loved you and tried to encourage you in the Lord, it would be a great joy for me 
to hear the Lord say to you, obviously it'll be a joy to you. It'll be the thrill of your life. But it'll be the absolute joy to me to have the Lord look at Frank Wallowin and say, well done, good and faithful servant. That'll be a blessing to you, brother. I'll tell you what, it'll be a blessing to me. Amen? So with that in mind, if it is something that we are definitely going to be a part of, then it's something we need to understand, isn't it? What is the judgment seat of Christ? I mean, what, what's, uh, how are we going to be judged? How can we be, as we'll talk about this morning, how can we be rewarded? And so uh, let's give ourselves this morning to this absolute certainty. If you're saved, that you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians now, chapter 3. We're going to spend the bulk of our time now in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. And I'm going to just uh, challenge but also teach on the judgment seat of Christ. A lot of misconceptions, a lot of what does it mean and what's it going to be a part of. Let's just let the Bible speak for itself and let's just look to the Word of God and, and see and, and be helped and be challenged by this thought of something that... <laughs> And, and, and we will do it. I, I, we talk about health coverage. Uh, I uh, a couple, maybe a year or two ago, uh, I used to go. I used to go to the dentist twice a year. Nice. And now I go to the dentist once a year. You know why? It's expensive. That's why. You know what? I that appointment, brother Frank. That appointment. I just I just push that off. You know what? This appointment we're not going to push off. Amen. This one, you may call the doctor tomorrow and say, you know what, I'm just not going to show up today. Friend, I can tell you, when you're summoned to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be there. Amen? Amen. <laughs> there's, no, there's no hitting the snooze button. There's no rescheduling. You're going to be there. Now, learn this. There are three types of judgments that we all face. Every person, I don't care who you are, I don't care how young you are, I don't care how old you are, I don't care how much money you make, there are three judgments that every single person faces. You ready? Number one, there is the judgment as, as sinners. Number two, there is the judgment as sons and daughters. And then number three, there is the judgment as servants. You got it? Sinners, sons, and servants. All right? Now, how does God judge us as sinners? Well, very clear, clearly, that if you do not get saved, if you do not trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, my Bible says that you will stand at the great white throne judgment. That is not for saved people. That is for lost people. And let me say this. There are people that say, well, you know what? When I stand there, uh, you, know, you ever heard people talk like this? Yeah, me, me and God, we're going to talk it out. No, you're not going to talk it out. Me and God will figure it out. No, you're, there's no figuring. If you, if you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, I can promise you on the authority of the Word of God, you will stand at the great white right throne judgment, and you will hear God say to you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. There's no bargaining. Anybody that goes to the great white throne will be cast into hell, period. All right? Now, again, uh, for, for those of us who are saved, praise God, our, that judgment for us is already passed. Amen? Amen? You, say, when, when, you say, Pastor, when were, when were you judged for that? I, I was judged for that on Calvary. Amen? Amen? And my sin, not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. Amen? I, that, for me, is already passed. Because Jesus took my judgment. I, he took my sin. And so that for me, that judgment is past. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Praise God. No condemnation for those of us who are Saved. And I hope you're saved here this morning. Now, the second judgment I said was we are judged as sons or daughters. All right? Because if you are saved and you willfully, deliberately sin, 
The Bible says that whom the Lord loves, he rebukes and he chastens. Amen. Amen? You say, well, preacher, if, if, I, if I'm saved and I sin, does that mean I lose my salvation? That's impossible. Amen. You cannot lose your salvation. Amen. But I'll tell you this. You, God's not going to lose, make you lose your salvation. But I'll tell you what he will do. He'll carry you to the woodshed. Amen. Amen. And by the way, do you know what the Bible says? That if you are without chastisement, and you can sin, and there's no rebuke, there's no conviction, there's no rebuke from God, and listen, don't pat yourself on the back. Good chance you're lost. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you know what the Bible word is? You're bastards Amen. and not sons. You say, preacher, you ought not talk that way, friend. That's what the Bible says. I'm just preaching the Bible today. All right? Listen, but you can never lose your salvation. Whom the Lord loves, he rebukes and he chastens and he scourges. The Bible says every son and whom he receives. So God deals with us as sons on, on a daily basis. All right? Now, one day, now, so if, if you're saved here this morning, our, 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 our judgment as sinners is past. Our judgment as sons is daily. All right? You see, when you get saved, God does not wire you to where you can't sin anymore. God just wires you where you can't sin and enjoy it anymore. Does that make sense? Amen? You're going to get rebuked. All right? Now, so that's sin, uh, judgment as sinners, judgment as sons and daughters. But the judgment seat of Christ is future, where we will be judged for our service. All right? Now, listen to me. You are going to be there if you are saved. You are going to come to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let's spend a few moments talking about what that is. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I want to begin reading in verses 11 down to verse 15 or 16. 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now look at 1 Corinthians 3. Paul here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, is using an illustration. And he's using the illustration of a temple. Now this is not a physical temple. This is a spiritual temple. As I've said many times, in the Old Testament, God had a temple for his people. In the New Testament, God has a people for his temple. So you and I are building lives. We are building temples. Now, according to verse number 11, this temple, if you're saved, has a spiritual foundation. All right? It's verse number 11. For other foundation, you see that word, can no man lay, then that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So he is the foundation of our lives if we are saved. Now, according to verse number 12, though, you and I are building lives. And you and I are building lives of either wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones. All right? Now, here's what's going to happen. Paul says here, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, that one day our lives are going to come into account. That we're going to stand before God. And we're going to find out if our lives were gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. According to verse number 13, there is coming what you could call a torch test. The Bible says that it will be revealed, verse 13, by fire. God will reveal. Listen, can I tell you this this morning? As kindly and compassionately, but as strongly as I can say, you can fool me, but you'll not fool God. 
You can fool your pastor. You can fool your spouse. You can fool anybody that you can not fool God. He's talking here the difference, and you can just summarize it this way. He's talking about the difference between spiritual people and carnal people. And I tell you that most people in most churches are not spiritual, they're carnal. They are not gold, silver, and precious stones. They are wood, hay, and stuff. But one of these days, I'm going to stand before God. One of these days, you're going to stand before God, and we are going to give an account. By the way, don't say, well, you know what? Someday, way, way out there, I'm going to stand before God. Don't think of it that way. You may stand before God before this day is over. Amen? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That's what the Bible says. You say, well, preacher, I feel great. Good for you. You may get run over by a truck. Yeah. True? Let's just be honest. Don't, listen, don't, don't think about it as someday way out there. You know what the Bible says? There is but a step between me and death. Yeah. We don't know when that day is going to be. We just know that day is coming. Now, Let's go to three simple things. I want to try to get you ready. I can't. I want you to hear well done. I want to hear well done. So let's look at some things about the judgment seat of Christ. When we stand before the Lord, we want to hear well done. We want to be gold, silver, and precious stones people. All right? Now, number one, first of all, number one this morning, the judgment seat of Christ will be a time of revelation. It'll be a time of revelation. Verse number 13, it says, it shall be revealed by fire. And when we stand before the Lord, we will, and, and God will truly see the kind of living, life that we have lived. We will see it in that day, not from man's perspective, but we will see our lives from God's perspective. Now again, there are a lot of things that people think that are important today. Can I just be honest? God says, aren't they? Do you agree with that? A lot of things that people say are important today, God is not impressed with. You remember when Samuel was told to go look for a king? They didn't want, they didn't want God's way, they wanted their own way, so they chose a man by the name of Saul. How many remember that, right? Remember what he says? God says, Saul, you go down there, and those Amalekites, they're wicked, they're ungodly, and you wipe them out, you wipe their animals out, I mean, you totally destroy them. Remember that? And Saul did. He goes down there, he wipes them out, but does he do totally destroy? He didn't, did he? Remember that? He kept back the animals. He kept back a portion for himself. Remember what God told Samuel? Go down and talk to Saul. He goes down there and talks to Saul, and and, 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 and Samuel says, Saul, did you do it? God wants you to oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Bad. Bad. Samuel says, uh, here's some bleeding of sheep. And Saul, being a good Baptist, somebody say amen. He spiritualized why he was disobeying God. Some must have been at that. Well, yeah, but yeah, I didn't destroy them all, Lord. But, you know, we kept them back for sacrifice. Right. Did God say, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't think of that. No. Is that what God said? What did God say? To obey is better than sacrifice. Yeah. Listen, to obey is better than sacrifice. I'm just here to say this this morning. What man applaud, what man looks up to, does not necessarily impress God. You know, you think about what, what this world's impressed with. Beauty, brains, brawn, bucks. God's not impressed with that. Amen? We, you may impress somebody else with that. Let me give you a verse. Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus is speaking in Luke 16, 15. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Did you hear that? That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And friend, here's the thing. One of these days, our hearts are going to be revealed before God. Look at verse 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 13. 
It says, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what, what's the next word? Sort. Of what sort it is. Notice he doesn't say in verse 13, uh, Brother Michael, he doesn't say what size it is. He says what sort it is. You see, God's more interested in quality than he is quantity. You know, Americans, we, we, yeah, bigger the better. You know, you go home today, turn on your television set. We got the super triple decker cheeseburger with nine pieces of bacon on it. Nice. Yeah, like, yeah, big. Amen? No. That's the way Americans are. Nice. But friend, listen. God's more interested in quality than quantity. Yeah. By the way, what would you rather have? A truckload of hay or a handful of diamonds? Hmm? What's more valuable? You understand where I'm going there? Of what sort it is there in verse number 13. All right, so here's the question, all right? What is God, what is God looking at? When, he, when we stand... Before, turn me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I'm going to give you three things. Very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. What is God going to judge me based on? Well, I'm going to give you three words that start with A. Number one, may I say this? God is going to judge you based on your attitude. Why you do what you do. Can I tell you this this morning? And again, I'm not trying to demean it all. But can I say this this morning? If you came this morning because you're made to, or because you had to, or because it was the right thing to do, and you really don't want to be here and all that, can I tell you this? You have your reward. Your attitude's not right. You know, there are some people who serve, and I've heard this in 27 years of ministry, well, yeah, I guess we'll do it because somebody has to around there. Nobody else will, but I guess I will. Nobody else down that church will do it. I guess I will. You have your reward. Your attitude is not right. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, For though I preach the gospel... I am nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. You see that? But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Now listen, I'm, I'm going to give you a little, little insider information on how your pastor operates. You may notice that a lot of times I don't beg people to do stuff. Please! Please! You say, preacher, where did you learn that from? Bud Martin. Who's Bud Martin? My pastor I served under. God willing, if the Lord doesn't come back next January, the first Sunday of the year, he's going to stand in that pulpit. He's going to preach for us. He's going to stay and preach the camp meeting of the Lord. Bud Martin, I became his assistant back in 1996. You know what he told me? He got me aside one day and he said, Brian, he said, I used to beg people to do stuff around here. He said, then I got to the place, you know what? If they don't do it for Jesus, I don't want them doing it for me. I learned something that day. I learned something. Do it for the Lord. Notice if we do it willingly, we have a Reward, not grudgingly. And so here's the thing. God, God knows. Sometimes people are forced into service. Come on, people! We need somebody to work in the nursery. Come on! Don't you people love God? Don't you people love stinking babies? <laughs> I work in the nursery. No! Do it for Jesus. Amen? You have your reward. I know we don't have any stinking babies. Amen. That's other churches. Amen. Amen. You know what? Let me say it this way. Some people do it to be seen of men. Brother Frank, did you know 
that I did this around the church this week. Did you see? Did you drive by? What I? Did I tell you, Brother Frank? Did I? Did you see? You know what? And would you just pat me on? Would you pat me on the back? I need that. Oh, a little over to the little to the right. Oh, thank you, thank you. That feels so good. And you know what? Some, and I would laugh about that. That's what some people do. What they do for. And when that doesn't happen, well, they just don't appreciate me down there at that church. Hmm? Our attitude. Our attitude. All right? Again, I'm not talking about saved or lost here. Listen, it's already said. I'm talking about rewards. Now, number two, letter B. Write this down. The second word I want you to write down is the word authority. Authority. All right, God is only going to judge us by our attitude. God is going to judge us by our authority. Did we have the authority of the word of God for what we did? Can I tell you, if there is, if there is a word that this world hates, it's the word authority. Now, here's the problem. It's easy to point our fingers out there, but can I tell you, I've met a lot of Christians that don't like that word. <laughs> yeah. The authority of the word of God, the authority of the house of God, hey, the authority of the pastor. They don't like that authority, but let me give you a verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 5. It says, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Friend, listen, if you are, uh, if you go to a race, let's say you go down to the, the down to the, uh, down to the racetrack where they race cars. Friend, if that guy cuts through the middle there of that track and doesn't stay on the track, you know what? He'll get disqualified. Why? Because he did it unlawfully. That is uh, the breaking of the rules. All right? And again, so there is the authority. Do you have the authority of the word of God? We have a whole lot of people today. Uh, that don't uh, want to be under the authority of the Word of God. They don't want to be under the authority of a church. They don't want to be under the authority of a pastor. They want to be their own little lone ranger. They really do. They don't want to be under the authority, the, those authority there. But friend, let me tell you this. Everything has authority. And we need to be under the authority at God's place. And by the way, can I just speak for myself for just a second? Thank you very much. The authority that I have you know where it comes from? God. I don't have any of myself. It comes from God. By the way, you, you go over there in the Old Testament to, to Moses. They started criticizing Moses. Remember that? Did God say, you shouldn't pick on Moses? You know what God said? Why are you murmuring against me? Huh? He said, they were murmuring against you, God. They were murmuring against Moses. Question. Who put Moses in that place? God did. Amen? Let's move on. It's quiet when we talk that way. Now, number three. Number three, we're going to be judged according to our ability. To our ability. Here's the thing. God requires more from some people than he does others. Brother Bill, I'm not going to stand before God and give an account of what you do. And you're not going to stand before God and give an account of what I do. Because here's the thing. Newsflash. My name is not Bill Berry. His name is not Brian Law. Amen? And either one of our names is Frank Ball. Does that make sense? Amen. You're not going to have to give an account for what I do. I'm not going to have to give an account for what you do. Here's the thing, though. I am going to give an account of what I do. What abilities did God give to me. Let me give you a verse, Luke chapter 12 and verse 48. The Bible says in Luke 12, 48, for, for, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. See, God's not going to test you on, because here's the thing, God knows what you can do. Amen? Amen. And God knows what I can do. I'm going to stand before God someday and give an account of what I can do. You say, well, preacher, let's take, let's take, let's take uh, singing. You say, preacher, I can't sing. You know what? God's not going to hold you accountable for singing. Amen? But if you can sing, then God is going to hold you accountable for that. 
Interesting, let me give you an illustration in the Bible. You remember that story about the woman who put in her mites? Remember that? Jesus saw what she gave. Remember that? By the way, Jesus always sees the offering. Amen? He does. You know what's interesting? She put in her two little widow's mites. I don't know. Maybe she had them in a in, in, in a in, in a little in, in a little. It's probably embarrassed, brother Frank. She probably embarrassed. And when the other ones came by, she probably just went. Hi. And Jesus said, "Whoa! Did you Hi. see what she gave? Hi. Two mites. Hi. Two widow's mites. Hi. You know what Jesus said of her? It's always amazed me, Hi. brother Jeff. He didn't say she gave more than anybody." He said she gave more than everybody. Hello? I'm sure there's $100 bills in there, $1,000 checks, and they would have had them in that day. And here's a woman with two little mites gave all she had. You know what I believe God looks at? When our, when God looks at our giving. I believe he's far more impressed with the balance than he is what's on the check. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? She gave more than anybody. I mean, she gave it all. She didn't even know. I mean, this this was all this is all she had between her and starvation. This is all she had between all that. And she gave it all. She put it all in there. And Jesus said, Wow. Look what she gave. Friend, that's the thing. She had she did what she could. I love that story. With Mary in that alabaster box of women, don't you? And she breaks that and she lavishly perfumes the feet of Jesus and, 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 and dries his hair, uh, his, his feet with her hair. And, and they all got upset with her and, 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 and all of that. And they, they criticized her. Jesus didn't criticize her. You know what Jesus said? Leave her alone. Yeah. And then Jesus said this. She hath done what she could. Amen. Hey, listen, church, this morning, wouldn't it be great that if every person in here, if every one of us just did what we could? Amen? We, we have in, in, in the back back there uh, 24 stacks of tracks. Wouldn't it be neat if everybody did what they could in giving out tracks? I wonder how many tracks would be given out if we all did what we could. I wonder... What the attendance would be like in church if we came every time we could. I wonder if we served like we could or, or give like we could or a witness like we could. Listen, God's not trying to hold you to something you cannot do. He's saying do what you can according to our ability. And by the way, let me say a couple things about this before I move on. First of all, don't say this. Don't say this. I can't do anything. Don't insult God by that. Mm -hmm. God's given us all abilities. Amen? All abilities. And by the way, if you're saved, I'm not preaching on this today. Everybody has at least one spiritual gift. I believe that with all my heart. Don't insult God. And, and here's the thing. Don't insult God by saying you don't have any abilities. And then you know, also, let me turn it the other way. Don't you go bragging on yourself. Right. Amen? What do you have that wasn't given to you from God? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can do this. Friend, you can do nothing without Christ. Right. Right? And all, all the glory, all the glory goes to God. All right? But here's the thing. What you can do, you should do. All right, so you got it? Number one, attitude. You're doing it for the right reason. Number two, authority. You have God's word, God's authority on that thing. And then number three, your ability. Serve God according to what he has given you. Now, number two, quickly. Number two, and we'll move very quickly in points two and three. Number two, go with me to first, back to 1 Corinthians 3. Number two, back to 1 Corinthians 3. The judgment seat of Christ, number one, will not only be a time of revelation. Number two, it'll be a time of reward. It'll be a time of reward. Look at verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall, you see that, receive a reward. Look at verse 8. Back to verse 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. 
Let me just pause here a minute and preach on this. That, you know, there are people who think, well, you know what? We all just going to be the same up in heaven. No, we're not. No, we're not. Some people think, well, you know, God will be un American if he didn't pay us all the same, if he was an equal, equal opportunity employer. No, friend, there are rewards in heaven. There are going to be rewards in heaven. Heaven is, listen, hell is not going to be the same for everybody, and heaven is not going to be the same for everybody either. We need to understand that. All right? And people say, well, you know, preaching don't matter. As long as I get to heaven, friend, it does matter. Let me give you Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Now listen to this. And their works do follow them. Now listen, our works don't take us to heaven, but our works follow us to heaven according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Revelation 22, verse 12. Jesus said, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to as his work shall be. The Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. It's a time of reward. Number three, and finally this morning, and here's what I don't want it to be for us, but for some people, it'll be a time of regret. Look at verse 15, these solemn words. He says, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Notice those words. Again, we like that word shall. But friend, this is just as much that word, isn't it? He shall suffer Lost. You say, are they lost? No, they got the right foundation. They're saved according to verse 11, which is Jesus Christ. But friend, I'm here to tell you this morning that if we live a selfish life, if we live a self-centered life, if we live a casual life, if we live a prideful life, if we live that way, friend, and you live for self and self alone, let me tell you what you're building. You're building wood, hay, and stubble. One of these days, it's going to go up in flames. You say, and again, people say, well, it don't matter as long as I'm saved. Friend, it does matter. Let me give you a verse. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children. He's not talking about small kids. He's talking about his children. People are saved. Abide in him. And when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed. We. If Jesus Christ were to come back today, he said, well, I'm saved. Let me, let me ask you a question. Would you be ashamed? The Bible says some are going to be ashamed when he comes. Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these, these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 2 John 2, verse 8 again, shall receive a full reward. That's what we want, amen? A full reward. Revelation 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Friend, we are going to be judged as servants. And some will suffer loss. Let me finish with this story. Let's say there's a man. And let's say this man doesn't believe in banks. All of his stocks, all of his bonds, all of his money, all of his everything. His wife and kids are all in his house. And let's say this man wakes up in the middle of the night tonight. And that man sees flames on his walls. He sees his house is engulfed with flames. He is choking with the smoke. And all of those things. He doesn't have time to grab his money. He doesn't have time to grab his stuff. He doesn't have time to wake up his wife. He doesn't have time to wake up his children. And let's say this, man. And the, I mean, the walls are getting ready to fall in. The house is on fire. And let's say this man sees that there is a, a small path through that wall. And I mean, it's just instinct. He knows the house is on fire. And he jumps through that wall. And as he jumps through that wall, there's embers of coals on him, uh, on his pajamas that he's in, and, and all those things. And he's literally smoking, but he gets out with his very life. 
And this man looks, and as soon as he gets out, he then looks behind him, and the, and the walls of his house crash, and he hears the screams of his wife, and he hears the screams of his children. And let's say this man has a neighbor that comes over. And let's say the guy's name is Tom. And he says, Tom, how you doing? Do you think that guy who, who's everything, everything in his life got burned up before his eyes, his wife, his precious children, maybe his grandchildren, I don't know, but they're all there in the house. Do you think that guy's going to say, well, praise God, I got out. Praise God, I got out. <laughs> Let's go celebrate. I got out. You think that guy's going to say that? Fred, I don't understand it all, but here's what I do understand. My Bible says that some saved people are going to suffer loss. If we live carnal, selfish lives, I can tell you this, there's going to be regret. By the way, let me say this and I'm done. People say, yeah, you know, there ain't going to be no tears in heaven. That's a lie. My Bible says that God's going to wipe away the tears. You know what I believe? I believe it's going to take a supernatural work. It's going to take a supernatural work of God for some people to even enjoy heaven. Because God didn't do that work. We will see that neighbor. We will see that loved one. We will see that co-worker. We will see that person that we never witnessed to. Looking at us and saying, why didn't you tell me? Why did you live so carnal in front of me? Why did you live for Jesus in front of me? Suffer loss. It's a serious thing. And this is a certainty, isn't it? I'm not trying to be mean today. God knows my heart. I pray to this message. I'm not trying to hurt you. I'm trying to help us. Amen? I want you to hear what I've done. Thou good and faithful servant. Ready you're saved, this day is coming. Ready or not, here it comes. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's stay down here just a minute. And why, Lord, have